Okay, Tony. So is that is that our hint to get started? I think this is a good time. All right, let's do it. Be respectful of everyone's time. Is Marie here? We're gonna have the land and labor acknowledgement before we jump into our meeting. Marie, are you here? Yes, I am here. The, Tony, are you ready to read? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Tony, you ready? Greetings, everyone. <clears throat> On behalf of North Seattle College, we acknowledge that we occupy the traditional ancestral lands of the Coast Salish peoples, Duwamish, Muckleshoot, Tulalip, Snoqualmie, and Suquamish, continuing to honor their traditions, culture, history, and customs. We ask that we take this opportunity to thank the original caretakers of these lands, heirs, waters, relatives, both human and more than human, who are still here today. We ask that participants consider their responsibilities to the people and land both here and elsewhere, and to stand in solidarity with Native, Indigenous, and First Nations people and their sovereignty, cultural heritage, and lives. We acknowledge the forced and unpaid labor of enslaved peoples that is the foundation of the U.S. and has not been compensated. It is our collective responsibility to critically intake these histories, to repair harm, and to honor, protect, and sustain this land. Thank you, Tony. Okay, this is the this is today's agenda. We are going to do another one of these uh, probably in the spring. Uh, I'd say in March. Uh, and we plan to do this in the fall, but the budget hadn't been approved until November. So now that we have an approved budget and some other things have been finalized, we are moving forward with this information. How this is going to work is that there may be questions in the chat we'll attempt to respond to in the chat. Um, and then at the end, if we have enough time, we'll respond to questions live. But there will also be an opportunity to submit your questions via a link, and then we'll answer those questions in our in our news briefs or in a separate email. Uh, so again, I'll let you read the agenda for yourself. We are going to do this as we've typically done it, which is around Robin. I am not going to talk to you for an hour and a half. You don't want to hear me for an hour and a half. Each each person is going to uh provide updates from their areas which those should be very comprehensive updates and again if you want to ask questions in the chat you can we are going to save the chat just in case there are a number of questions that we don't get to uh, but the goal here is to answer all of your questions if we can answer them we will if we can tell you we will next slide so for my part of the update, I'm going to give you a, a, an update on the affordable housing project, as well as uh, the status of food resources on campus, and then also talk to you about the budget, uh, and then the uh, budget requests going into the legislative session that just began. Next slide. Okay, so affordable housing update. <clears throat> Uh, many of you are aware, if not all of you are aware, that we have been working with Bellwether Chief Seattle literally for two and a half years to uh, try and have affordable housing on three acres here at North. Uh, we have jumped many hurdles with the SBCTC, and uh, the final hurdle is the lease. Uh, and there is a challenge there because this is a groundbreaking project for community uh, and technical colleges here in the state of Washington. Uh, the University of Washington has a project that is similar, but not so much as far as the land and the buildings. So everyone refers to their project, but it is not like this one. Uh, we're pressing forward on it because one, we know it's what's needed for our college community, and two, 
uh, we know that there are three or four other uh, CTCs who are planning to do something similar, either with the facilities they already have or in a partnership like we are in with Bellwether and Chief Seattle. So the slide you're looking at right now uh, are the conditions of the project that were approved in a special meeting last August by the SBCTC board. And this was some of the, these are the conditions. Uh, this is not a public work. Uh, it's not a gift of land. We're not giving anything away. We are not financing the structure. Uh, Bellwether and Chief Seattle are raising the funds. Uh, the state is not financing this. Prevailing wages will be paid. And I know with the last project that North proposed to SBCTC, that was a deal breaker. Uh, but we've, we've corrected all of that. Um, the lease term will be no more than 99 years, and at this point, the lease that the lawyers are working on is 87 years, which is typical for this kind of project. Uh, the lease is for approximately three acres out of our 62 acres, so considering the amount of land that we have, three acres, it's not a lot. Uh, and uh, instead of, I think the last time we talked about this, there was going to be a, a longhouse. But Chief Seattle decided that they had enough um, to manage with their other longhouses and it, they weren't necessarily willing to manage this one. So we have then changed it to a 5,000 square foot intellectual house, which you probably heard of something similar at the UW. As part of this agreement that they're working on, $3.3 million will be given to the college for us to design this intellectual house however we choose to, so that it can be used for our purposes. Uh, and $1.3 million will be given to us for operations and maintenance of that facility. So that's what's being discussed right now. And again, the lawyers are working on it, uh, but it, you know, it's been a long haul and we've got some really good people uh, trying to move this forward and recognizing that this is groundbreaking for the CTCs and it will be beneficial to the community. So the structure that you're looking at now, this this is not actually structure, but the, the, the design or the layout that you're looking at now is what was shared with SBCTC or one of the items that was shared. This is the one we could actually get into this PowerPoint presentation. And as you can see, um, <clears throat> you can see the actual design of the housing. You can see the parking. Uh, and then where the college intellectual house will land and it will be directly faced to the college so that we have exclusive access. Uh, and if you recall in the last presentation, the affordable housing uh, will have up to three bedrooms. There will be studios as well as an area, uh, area for foster youth to be transitioned into or out of foster youth and into the community. And that will be run by Bellwether. Uh, we will not run the, the facility. We will only manage the intellectual house. So stay tuned for that. As you know, the legislators have decided that affordable housing is one of their main priorities in this legislative session, and we intend to take full advantage of that. So we will give you an update uh, in March. Next slide. And this is just the illustration. This was my frustration uh, yesterday. The attorneys are still working on the conditions of the lease and it's pretty much like this to be perfectly honest with you. Uh, there are several attorney generals working on it. We have bellwether attorneys working on it. Uh, and so we're, we're wanting to do this right. Uh, so stay tuned for more information on that. Next slide. Uh, and real quick, there's a question, uh, is the $1.3 million for intellectual house operations a one-time infusion? Yes, and it's up to us to manage it and, and, and make it last. Uh, will students get first access to the housing? Uh, no, they will not because this is not student housing. Uh, Bellwether has a way that they manage their affordable housing. And in many cases, it's based on you know, your qualifications for affordable housing and in many ways, first come, first serve. So student, this is not student housing and they will not uh, have priority. However, students will be able to live in the housing. Staff will be able to live in the housing if they qualify. Okay, food. 
Uh, as you all know, the micro market is open. Um, we are tweaking uh, the operations of the micro market. It's only been a couple of weeks and we do recognize that there need to be prices on the food and um, we're going, we're, we're establishing inventory as far as what's selling, what isn't, what is in demand and what isn't. And we will tweak that as we go along. Um, we are looking for part-time staff and we will be looking for a full-time uh, classified staff member. So if you know of anyone who can work part-time, they can be a student or not, but they wouldn't be considered a student worker. Please make sure they reach out to Stone Tony Stankovic. Uh, and we can uh, show them how to get through the application process. And then you should see a full-time position being open shortly uh, for us to hire a full-time person to serve as the, the staff anchor um, for that area. We are still working on the espresso lounge. We're still in conversation with our union partners about that. Um, and you know we're adamant about having coffee on campus, as well as other things. We know it's necessary, uh, and, and we know that it's a win-win agreement that we're proposing, but we do have to honor our union agreements, and so we are working through the process on that. <clears throat> we are, uh, after all is said and done with the library, and they move back into their beautiful new home, we're going to begin conversations about the use of our kitchen facilities. We have beautiful kitchen facilities. Uh, and we don't have a culinary program. However, we have two other culinary programs within the Seattle colleges that may help us bring additional food resources to North Seattle College's campus by the use of our kitchens, as well as the possibility of allowing for ghost kitcheny. So I will share more on that once we get to that point, but we can't do any of it until the library is in their new home. Uh, and so we're really looking forward to all of that. And we'll probably be discussing this in the fall quarter. Uh, the library is supposed to move sometime in the fall quarter. And then we can talk about what will happen with the with that space. So there are wheels in motion. Please understand that we have to honor our union partners. There are contracts involved. Uh, we do have to involve district in the contract negotiations because some of the agreements are underneath district umbrella uh, uh, contracts. And it, it's a lot of work and we have to talk to a lot of people, but we do recognize that this is somewhat of a food desert and we're trying to work through it in a way that is sustainable for the college. And yes, Emily, that's what the ghost, that's what the ghost kitchening is about, uh, is, is renting out the kitchen facilities to outside people. There's actually a web system, a website where you can register your location as a ghost kitchen and there is a process and then you can allow people to use your kitchens uh, to provide those quote unquote ghost services. So yes, absolutely. We have to think outside of the box on this one and have our entre entrepreneurial spirit in play. Next slide. Okay, budget. Now, I, this is the entire Seattle College's operating budget. You all probably saw it as part of the board packet. And uh, I, don't, don't look at South and don't look at, look at Central. Let's take a look at North. It looks like all of our efforts have paid off. And I say all of our efforts, all of your efforts, all of the feedback, all of the work that has been done by everyone. Uh, to right size the budget for North Seattle College. So as you can see, for 22-23, our projected revenue is about 41.3 million. And again, that is just a projection. We were very conservative in our projections, by the way. So if we go over, that's even better, but we were very conservative. Our budget Budgeted expenditures are only 40.9 million. Small print, uh, maybe we can make that a little bigger, but I think 40.9 million. Look at my cheat sheet here. Ah, that is correct. Uh, and as you can see, there is an anticipation that we will have somewhat of a surplus of $408,000. And I'm going to be realistic with you uh, and tell you that it will probably be a little less than that. We are regaining capacity. 
Uh, we know that there will be salary increases coming up as part of this budget year. And so this number may change. So please do not come back at the end of the year and say, where's the $408,000 in surplus? Because I'm telling you, it is probably going to be less. However, you need to, to recall that we were anticipated to have a 1.9 million deficit this year. And that we should not have at the end of this year. So kudos to everyone who, who, who did a lot of work. Um, we've right-sized things and now we can rebuild capacity knowing that it's being done on a more solid foundation than what we had previously. And uh, the information below on this slide, which by the way, this PowerPoint can be, will be shared with everyone. You know, Tony sends them out um, with the minutes or with the recordings and we'll do the same thing for this presentation. Um, there's also information on, on here about the categories of expenditure. Uh, so you'll notice, and you may want to drill down on this at another time, uh, that you know we spend about 51% of our budget on salaries and wages, and then another almost 20% on benefits. Uh, and that's typical. That is typical for, for colleges. Uh, so don't be surprised by that. Uh, and then there's another category, a program category of expenditures where uh, you can see, you know, as an example, in instruction, 52% of our budget is in instruction, 13% in academic support, 3% in libraries, that kind of thing. So this is information that's been shared with the board and I'm sharing with it with you again, uh, because it is public information and it's supposed to be on the website. I'm not sure it is, but I want to make sure that you all have this as well. Um, also notice that with regards to Running Start and international programs, we are regaining capacity there as well. Um, the revenue is expected to far exceed our expenditures with regards to Running Start. And uh, as for international programs, you know, that's, that's, that's going to be a, a, a heavy lift and a, a slow growth or regrowth. But we seem to be doing well in that area as well. So again, it, you know, it's a slow process. International programs are obviously controlled or are, are affected by, I should say, our political environment. Uh, and we're coming back. It's very clear. And then our Running Start students are recognizing that Running Start is a good deal. It's a good thing to do. Um, we're emerging from, from COVID and um, they're coming back. And so we're happy about that. Next slide. And I wanted to touch bases with you on the legislative priorities for this legislative session and what the uh, State Board of Community and Technical Colleges is asking uh, of the legislature. Um, because the legislature is uh, fully back, uh, we are all going to be running to Olympia every month to advocate <laughs> for these legislative priorities as well as for our individual projects. Uh, and so uh, as part of WAC, which are the presidents and the SBCTC leadership, uh, what you're seeing here has been established as the legislative priorities going into the session. This is what we are asking the legislature to do for us as community and technical colleges. Um, again, fully funding competitive compensation. One of our arguments is that we can't compete salary-wise with K, K through 12 but we are higher ed and that just, that doesn't make a lot of sense. So the request is for $157 million and that's for all the, the CTCs. Again, uh, advancing equity, diversity and inclusion efforts that are already underway. Um, that's important. We have, many colleges have started the efforts. There are some colleges within the CTCs who have not. And so this will allow everyone to, to have some kind of start or to continue the work. So supporting workforce development program, $77 million. That is a clear effort to get people educated and back to work or to work. Uh, improving the infrastructure. You know, that includes CTC link and other uh, infrastructure issues, not only for the system, but for the individual colleges. We recognize that we have some catching up to do. And so we're asking for 93 million there. And then funding for systems capital project list. There is a massive capital project list that equates to about $1.7 billion. And that's not the entire list. 
That's only going down to about line 20 on that list. Uh, and then there are requests for additional monies under the guise of capital that will help us with deferred maintenance and other things. You've heard us say that North Seattle College alone has about $60 million in deferred maintenance. And what that means is that the legislature basically needs to catch up and take care of their buildings and their land and, and help us do that. Uh, and so uh, if our request is approved at $1.7 billion, then North is expected to receive about $5.8 million of that. And that will help with all of the the types of issues that we've had due to weather, electrical, upgrades, um, all of the things that you know we have been dealing with in the last few months because we have a 50 plus year old facility. Um, so you can see why we are heavily advocating for uh, the capital budget to be approved as well. Next slide. Okay, so I'm gonna check for the chat to see if there are any questions about anything I said. And then we're gonna let Michael talk to you more about what is going on uh, with the building. So give me a minute to, to check the chat. Um, great, wait, great question, Alyssa, regarding any surplus. Will it go towards Seattle Central's deficit? I just left a CEC meeting. Seattle Central ha has a plan to cover their deficit that does not include using our surpluses. The presidents have been on top of that. Just heard it literally like 20 minutes ago. Uh, yes, Mel, thank you for, for managing the micro market. Uh, really appreciate it. Um, it. It really helped it come to fruition in the time promised. So thank you so much, Mel. I want to thank you publicly for that. Uh, and Mel has been providing us with feedback. Uh, with regards to the operations and how things can be better. Uh, and then uh, Crystal Wall says, I know you said not to look at South and Central, but in the running start budget, Info South expenditures match their revenue. Do we know why that was the case? Ours was only a fraction of South's cost. We do not know why that is the case. I do know that South had has an, uh, an accounting anomaly uh, because, you know, they're, they're heavily apprenticeship. And so Julianne has said that there's some accounting that they're trying to resolve. So I'm not so sure that that break even is is accurate for them because some of their accounting is on the back end and it has to be because of the way they're paid for apprenticeships. But we're going to save this question and I will research it and get it back to you. Uh, yes, and CEC is Chancellor's Executive Cabinet. Thank you. Thank you so much for your questions. All right, Michael, you're up. All righty, thank you, Dr. Crawford. So good afternoon, everyone. I'm happy to have some good news to share today. We were able to restore the education building power earlier this morning. So that is some great news for us and classes will resume tomorrow morning. So I'm sure everybody's very curious on what happened exactly. And so when we had the heavy uh, freeze and the snow and ice rain, it created some uh, damage to the electrical feed that goes to the education building. So the insulation on the wires were damaged, creating a short circuit that was causing our main breaker to trip. And unfortunately that happened basically the first day of the quarter. So <laughs> that's just how these things kind of work. But uh, anyhow, we were able to get that repaired and get us up and going. So we're, we're very happy to report that back. That it's a, quite a process to get through. Um, there's been some questions about the arts and science building and what was going on with that. And we had a small electrical fire that created a closure the week of Thanksgiving. Thankfully, no one was injured. Seattle fire and security facilities all worked together to keep the fire contained. And we worked uh, safely with uh, city light to get the power disconnected. So the uh, building is currently operating on a generator while we're waiting for replacement parts for our electrical switch gear that are on back order. We're hopeful that we can get this back to city power and remove the large generator in front of the garage by about March. That, that's what the plan is currently. So the other question that I get all the time is the library renovation. How's that going? So we are in full swing since uh, November 1st of 21. We have ran into several product uh, lead time issues, but we've been able to substitute items on that project to keep it on time. We are currently working to replace the original elevator instead of just renovating it as the original scope had planned out. 
and substantial completion is still on schedule for the end of June of uh, this year. Um, facilities is also currently working with Johnson Controls to replace the stolen chiller outside the child care facility. Uh, because of city regulations, the new chiller will use modern refrigerant, and that is causing us a full replacement of the coils inside the HVAC unit. So we had to authorize an engineer to design a new system to work with this existing building. So that's kind of creating a, a slowdown, but we're currently expecting to have that unit replaced by spring quarter. Uh, facilities is also currently working with DES to replace carpet and furniture and the classrooms on the third floor of the instruction building and the college center building. And this work is slated to be completed by spring quarter. So we will definitely have to be moving some classes around when we start getting that work scheduled. And when we have a, uh, an update from the contractor, then we will be working with those people to make sure that classes are not affected. And that is what I have for our building updates. Pete, you're up. Yep, fumbling with my buttons. Sorry about that. Thank you um, so much, Michael. Stay around for questions if you can. I will. Thank yeah, you so and, much. And for the transition to me, I'll, I will take the uh, opportunity to kudos to Michael and Steve. Um, rem it seems like we're getting daily reminders that we're in a 55-year-old structure and uh, the, the bailing tape and wires and duct tape uh, that Michael and Steve have been able to do. And I, and I, I don't say that, um, I, I say that in a joking way, but uh, the work that they've been able to do is, is frankly incredible. So thank you. Uh, instruction and enrollment services, go ahead and, and click. Uh, I wanna cover a couple of topics that build on uh, the last uh, all college meeting uh, and then uh, add a little bit more to, um, to some, some newer updates as well. Uh, next one. Uh, enrollment and enrollment management updates uh, for fall and winter, and actually even back to the spring. Um, uh, building off of what uh, Dr. Crawford said earlier, it does look very much like the uh, state enrollments have reached uh, kind of a leveling off, and we're starting to see a recovery, not just at North, but also at South and at Central. So across the district, we are now seeing relative to the previous year um, in state enrollments that are at or higher than the levels uh, previously. For North specifically, we were at about 101% of our fall quarter state enrollment. And right now for winter quarter, we're at about uh, 99%. So uh, hopefully, that is a sign that we are now in the recovery from COVID and other economic uh, factors that drove enrollments down. There are two cautions that I wanna give relative to the state enrollment specifically. One is that in terms of uh, an increase in state enrollments or a hopeful increase in state enrollments, um, while we will be getting the tuition uh, for those higher and higher enrollments. Um, the state presidents did essentially freeze the allocation model. And so we won't be getting more state money relative to those enrollments because we are still below our goals, but we will, as I mentioned, be getting more tuition. So that those are more dollars that we can invest into the colleges. For the increased recruit, excuse me, recruitment and retention efforts, um, I want to give kudos to Enrollment Services, Susan Shanahan, Kathy Rhodes, Larry Spear, and all of the folks there, as well as across student services, advising and financial aid, workforce education, et cetera, um, to, in, to help with that recovery. And I want to highlight an example here. Um, Amy Brown in Title III, working with Enrollment Services, Financial Aid, Workforce Education, identified some unspent Title III CARES funds that we have directed towards unpaid tuition for students this academic year. So we have been able to assist students in the winter quarter 
uh, previously in the fall quarter and then hopefully looking to the spring quarter uh, to really extend our uh, Title III, excuse me, our CARES money, in particular, our Title III CARES money. So for you uh, teaching classes, that means you likely won't see the dip in enrollments uh, during the second week. Uh, and for everybody else on campus uh, and in the virtual world, we'll be holding on to those students that we normally would have to drop for non-payment. Next slide. Uh, personnel, there's a couple of uh, things that I wanna touch on that are in the slides, but before I do that, um, I wanted to acknowledge three individuals um, that have changed uh, positions or are planning since the last uh, uh, all college meeting. Um, first in workforce instruction, Chris McCurdy, uh, after years and years of wonderful service to the college has retired and Roberta Lord has stepped into Chris's role. And it was one of those moments where for all of us who knew, uh, there was a huge sigh of relief because uh, Roberta stepped right into the job as if she'd been there on day one uh, and helped with an incredibly smooth transition. And then I wanna also uh, offer a, a thank you uh, to Jan Westman uh, in the library who will be transitioning as well. And so we are working on that position. Now back to the slides. Uh, an update first on two in, the two instructional dean positions that are currently interim. In workforce instruction, we have, <clears throat> excuse me, committee together chaired by Brian Palmer uh, and are waiting final approval from the chancellor's office to launch, or to, excuse me, to post that position. Uh, and then in library and support services, committee is together and has uh, crafted a job description and position announcement and we are waiting for final approval at the district level to post that. So uh, we, once those are posted, uh, the committees are ready for the, as the applications roll in, and we'll get both of those positions filled on a permanent basis as soon as we can. Um, this quarter, we welcome two new tenure track full-time faculty based on some searches in the fall, BC Co. Uh, is our newest full-time tenure track faculty in the BAS application development. BC comes to us most recently from Seattle Central, where he worked in the IT program and in some of you may know the Year Up program. And then Elidia Sangerman uh, has made the transition from part-time to full-time tenure track in early childhood education. Thrilled to have Elidia on board in early childhood. Uh, and even more excited when I get to share, and, and many of you know this, uh, that Elidia's primary role will be with the Spanish-speaking cohort. And uh, that will allow us to continue to serve populations of students in their native language, which uh, really goes a long way towards uh, helping them advance in a comfortable learning environment. Next slide. Uh, big news in terms of full-time faculty searches, we will be launching 11 full-time faculty searches. Or we're in, in various stages of launching 11 full-time faculty searches in the following programs. You can see two in math and two in parent ed, and then one each in ESL, Bachelor of Science, Computer Science, Business, Art, Counseling, early childhood ed with a parentheses missing at the end there, sorry about that typo, and fire science. So really excited to get these searches launched. I know that that's a lot of work to launch the searches and will also be a lot of work to get these faculty through the tenure process, but in the end will be well, well worth it as we rebuild our full-time faculty uh, tenure track and then tenured ranks. Next slide, please. A few instructional program highlights. I wanna to touch on, uh, and I know this is nowhere near an exhaustive list of the instructional program highlights since we last talked, but a few in particular that I wanted to touch on. Uh, we have officially launched the Bachelor of Science in Computer Science with our first cohort, Eric Lloyd, Michelle Malero, Stephen Bailo, Melania Yanos, and others uh, worked uh, tirelessly to get that uh, cohort launched. Uh, we have an expansion of our climate justice work as Heather Price 
Brian Palmer and many others have successfully uh, applied for and received even more funding from the state board to, as I mentioned here, expand our climate justice work. Uh, Amy Brown and many, many others have been working on structural changes related to and driven by guided pathways. Academic subplans are uh, available on the applications for students to check. Uh, we continue to work on and refine pathways maps to make it uh, easier and clearer for the students to see how they get from where they are to where they want to be. And we also continue to work on, I, I, I want to say, 14 or, or so different subgroups as a part of Guided Pathways, making changes all throughout the college. The last two I have slides for, so I'm going to ask, uh, yep, thank you for an advancement. Uh, in the fall, we were selected uh, for a visit from the U.S. Uh, Department of Education. The Undersecretary, James Fall, had his choice of any uh, higher ed institution in Puget Sound to visit with his day off uh, while he was here for the NWCCU conference. And several in the Department of Education were familiar with our early childhood ed and IBEST programs, and he selected us. So he spent several hours with us on a Friday uh, touring the campus and then getting an incredible opportunity to meet with this panel that you see in the picture of students and faculty and uh, instructional support and leadership along with EDI to learn about IBEST, to learn about our early childhood ed program, and most importantly, to learn how those two programs work together to get the students further and faster in their uh, program goals. Next slide, please. I also wanted to uh, share, and I know many of you, of you know this as it's received a lot of press, but I wanted to share a really cool partnership that we had with Edmonds College uh, this summer uh, and that we are looking to uh, do a, a repeat next summer. For uh, many of you know that on the North End in the Green Belt, uh, we have uh, a historical tie to the Japanese American community with the Kumasaka family and the farm and orchards that they uh, maintained. Um, Edmonds Co uh, College reached out to us uh, about a year or so ago with an archeology span class and professor who wanted to use our site for a dig uh, to recover uh, artifacts and other items uh, from the Kumasaka family. So you can see a small picture here of the work that was done over the summer. Uh, there is a long list of items that were recovered uh, and discovered. Um, and through partnerships with some faculty, administrators, and students here at North, uh, that work will continue again uh, next summer. Thank you. Big thank you to John Figgy, Tracy Furtani, I know has done some work uh, out there in the past. And for those of you who remember Michael Brokaw, uh, head groundskeeper from a while ago, uh, he was really one of the first to identify and begin uh, documenting the existence of that family uh, and making North aware of uh, the presence of that family. I think that's it. Oh, I'm sorry, probably, uh, I'm sorry, very importantly, I also wanna share some really exciting news that the six faculty on the slide that you're seeing here, uh, Ann Murkowski and Benjamin Roberts and Leanne Dittmar and Justina Rumpogren and Christine Unitzer and William White um, have received the annual League Excellence Award. Uh, League of Innovation sponsors for its founding colleges um, the, an excellence award and uh, these six faculty are receiving that award this year. So congratulations to those and um, oops, sorry, I got distracted by the chat. Uh, and uh, and stay tuned for even more information about them. Uh, I just saw a chat uh, about uh, retirees. Uh, Alyssa, yes, uh, where I'm working on. I know that that list is big as well. I am working on compiling, and we will celebrate and honor those retirees at the annual service awards. Uh, I think which will be in May. Uh, I'm going to do a quick scan to see if there are questions for me. Yes, thanks from Heather to Brian for helping with that application. 
Um, yes, yeah, some well-deserved thanks to Roberta and others. And unless anybody tells me differently, oh, any possible plans of doing an exhibit of the dig findings? Yeah, we are talking with Edmonds uh, about that. Um, and uh, great minds think alike. We have thought about the library as an exhibit. Uh, and then I'm seeing a question that's not for me, so I will pass it off. Alice, I think you're up. Thank you, Pete. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Alice Melling, Executive Dean for Student Success. Um, go ahead. Thank you. For... This year's focus for student success has been about expanding and reopening services and student engagement. We implemented expanded services the week prior to the quarter and the first two weeks of the quarter with in-person services Monday through Friday, 8.30 to 4, and virtual services Monday, Thursday, Friday, 8 to 4.30, and Tuesday and Wednesday from 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. Uh, we will go back to our regular uh, winter hours next Monday, or actually Tuesday, starting um, January 17th. We do continue to find that many students choose to access our services virtually, and other than peak hours, such as the beginning of the quarter, approximately 45% of our students access our services virtually, and 55% of our students access us in person. So kudos to the adaptability of our team as they've embraced new technologies, providing students in both modalities which we're finding students are requesting to see us in both oh. modalities. Oh, yeah, yeah, we got that. Next, next slide, please. I'm not looking forward um, to Again, with reopening, um, our child care like center that. reopened fall of 2022, yes. and we're currently uh, serving um, two classrooms, one toddler classroom and one preschool classroom. Um, we're grateful to the city of Seattle for providing us with an approximately $48,000 grant to support our reopening. Um, and we greatly appreciate the work of our um, facilities uh, team in helping to get the center ready for our reopening. Um, partnership is a theme with the Child Care Center. We partnered with our Spanish parent ed co-op, uh, providing classroom space within the Child Care Center. And we're also partnering with our ECE BAS program serving as an internship site for BAS ECE students. Our connection is strong uh, between the Child Care Center and our ECE program. Um, our child care teacher, Jennifer, Jennifer Ocampo, is a recent graduate of the program. And welcome to Angelia Smith, our newest child care center teacher, who is also currently in the BAS program. So welcome, Angelia. Um, next slide, please. We've also reopened our Roy Flores Wellness Center this fall, and it's thriving with expanded programming, including nine drop-in classes and community engagement with several rentals using the facility. Um, we also have, a, a, again, a partnership with our Counseling Mental Health Grant, uh, which supported the development of a mindfulness space. And we also have a fitness clothing closet, which seeks to provide workout clothing for students in need. And this program was initiated by our director, Megan Valero. Um, details on drop-in classes can be found on uh, the website and then just access Megan's regular newsletter, which is a great resource to hear the latest on drop-in classes and additional programming. Next slide, please. Our faculty counselor team of Dr. Jenny Mao, Melissa Allen, and Emiko Minatoya Shields presented at fall quarters SBCT, SBCTC webinar, Lessons Learned from the Mental Health Counseling Pilot, where they shared how they're using the grant to destigmatize de and decolonize 
mental health services through innovative service delivery, such as our Let's Talk uh, programming and fun games and well-being cafe. And some great exciting news. Our grant um, originally was scheduled to wrap up in June of 2023 but it has been extended to 2025. So we're thrilled with that news and um, it's just very, very exciting. And um, from participating in that grant, um, we meet at least quarterly. And again, it is just one of four colleges in the state community college system that are participating. And I can say that North is leading the way in innovative approaches to uh, be addressing mental health. Um, and, and as we know, currently in our society, um, we're in a mental health crisis with increasing anxiety and depression um, facing many, many um, of, of our students. So we're just really thrilled to have this additional resource. Next slide, please. Our Student Support Services Unit within Student Success is led by Dean Dr. Mary Acup Nash and includes student financial services, student leadership, child care center, Roy Flores Wellness Center, and college access partnerships. Um, we are thrilled to have Brittany Harper in the interim role of student financial aids, student financial services. Uh, replacing the vacancy resulting from Brianne Sanchez accepting an interim Dean Registrar position, position at South. Brittany's last, first day was last Thursday, and she's definitely hit the ground running. Um, and we're just so happy to have uh, Brittany join the North Student Services team. Uh, student Financial Aid Services includes our one-stop our one, our launch pad, One Stop Student Center and uh, Veterans Military Services. We continue to refine the launch pad and just yesterday, new signage and window claims were installed in the area. A huge thank you for to our communications team, Mike Sprouse and Rocky Phelps for all of their assistance and collaboration. Next slide, please. The launch pad is the place to go to get your photo ID. Um, by between nine and 11 and one and three to get your photo taken. It just takes a few minutes and, and comes with a great uh, NSC tree frog lanyard. Um, so come stop by, get your photo ID and, and see our, our new setup. Next slide, please. Um, continuing with um, some updates on student support services, our student leadership team of Dr. Mary, Zulika Olvera, uh, Jean Robles, and our students, student body president, Grace Ochio, and the team of student leaders continue to collaborate with uh, campus partners and plan in-person programming to uh, promote student engagement, and a sense of belonging, um, such as the Winterfest that's, that's currently going on. To our um, college access partnerships, uh, TRIO and Anna Pizzi, um, our director, Quinton Neal, and TRIO navigator, Grace Seo, uh, held a very successful welcome for TRIO students last week. And congratulations to um, Dayon Perez, um, Quinton, Dayon Perez, Anna PZ Manager, and Jordan Veniegas, Anna PZ Navigator, for a very, very successful Anna PZ grant visit this past fall. Next slide, please. So on this slide are just a few of some upcoming events happening winter quarter. It is a, it's not at all a comprehensive list. Um, we encourage you to learn about our events through the student bulletin, department newsletters, and the North News Brief. Um, our student programming is designed to promote student success, student engagement, and a sense of belonging. 
Um, it takes a village to support our students. So we appreciate everyone's help in referring students to our services and our programming. Um, thank you all. And I can take a look in the chat here quickly to see if there's any specific questions. So, I'm going to pass it off to Marie. Thank you, Alice. Hi, everybody. My name is Marie Angelis. I use she, her pronouns, and I am the new director for equity, diversity, inclusion, and community here at North. Some of you I have had a chance to interact and meet, and there are many of you that I am still looking forward to get to know. Um, and so hopefully, if this is your first time seeing me, hello. Um, feel free to move to the next slide. So what I wanted to just start off with is a reintroduction to what is EDIC, Equity, Diversity, Inclusion, and Community, and what does that look like now here at North, and also more broadly across the colleges. And so you can see here, very simplified org chart that I'm providing um, has my role reporting directly to the Associate Vice Chancellor for EDIC, whom you all know, DeAndre, with also a dotted line reporting process to Dr. Crawford. And so part of my work is both responding to the needs of here, what's going on here at North, but also acknowledging my roles and responsibility for the district and serving more larger scale district goals and also focusing on what is really needed here at North in terms of our EDIC work. In terms of who I oversee or kind of manage, there's two big areas that we do, um, one of them being benefits hubs. So when we think about a lot of the support services um, that we're able to provide for folks looking for different needs around housing, food insecurity, benefits hub is a great place to start that conversation. And there are many of you on campus that are partners to that work or major contributors to making that work successful. We also have the Equity and Welcome Center, which is on the first floor of the college um, building. And that is also a space in which we have our navigators do one-on-one -on -one advising with our students. Um, we also provide programming opportunities, both in partnership with different campus folks, um, and then also internally, if there are other things that we would like to host for everyone. And it's also, in general, just a space to come by, bring your students, if they're looking for a quiet place to be or to be in community with others, staff and faculty are welcome into the space as well. It really is meant to be just another place on campus to connect, to talk, or to just find a quiet place to study. So I invite folks to come on down, say hello. Um, we sit on two floors of College Center, the first floor mainly having the Equity and Welcome Center, and then the second floor having staff offices as well. Next slide. And then I just wanted to highlight some faces. I couldn't get everybody's faces um, when I was doing this, but just wanting to show you who's part of this community that we are building under EDIC. Some of them report directly to me and others like Jessica Ababera reports to Amy Brown, but is a major contributor and partner to the work that we do because of what she does for Pathways. And so wanted to also highlight and acknowledge that she's part of our work as well. Um, and that we've got Paula, Mara, Belinda, and Sabrina, all members of the community who are contributing to EDIC work. Some faces you might see all the time um, and some faces you might not see as often. Sabrina Woodson is somebody who's supporting our work both um, at North, but also at the district level. And so sometimes she's here and sometimes she's at district, but many of the times you will see these faces involved in our events, our programs, or really just saying hello to people there. So next slide. And then you have here the equity, diversity, inclusion kind of larger scale piece there. So all of us as directors across North, Central and South report to DeAndre as the Associate Vice Chancellor for EDIC. We all have a dotted line to our presidents and then we all have our program support staff. And the piece here I wanna highlight around program support staff and what you may have noticed is that there's a shift in that structure. So TRIO and Anapizi are now programs that work under student services. And so we are all reshifting what is program support that we're really trying to focus on under the EDIC office and who are really great campus partners that we continue to engage with and continue to partner on when we're trying to think about how we support our students across this campus and across the colleges. So I just wanna highlight that for folks around just a little bit of what the restructuring has looked like and also what that means for our level of work. Our focus is to think about work both at the college level 
and as all of our team of directors to think about this at the district level to support all of the colleges. And next slide. So an example of that is our MLK Social Justice Week. Hopefully many of you have RSVP'd or are planning to attend in some capacity this Friday for our 50th annual celebration of Martin Luther King Jr. Um, it is bound to be a really fantastic event um, with a chance to listen to some beautiful music by our choir, um, amazing keynote speaker, and a chance really to recognize members of our community who are doing amazing work to contribute to justice and equity and service. We will not be able to recognize everyone, but there are members of North who are going to be recognized um, with an award during this event. So we do hope that you've RSVP'd and that you'll be able to attend. Um, there is also a way to join virtually, which I'm putting into the chat so folks have that. Um, watch it either virtually or come in person, but we are really excited to kick off this event um, and really kick off what is MLK Social Justice Week. So that event is our large scale district one. The next following events that are listed here are what we're doing to focus on specific campuses. So South is kicking off the week with a film screening, screening of I'm Not Your Negro on their sessions. And then January 18th, we are hosting a health equity panel to talk about the disparities and really in particular in our communities of color um, and how it is impacting our bodies, our lives and our choices. And I'm putting in the chat, the RSVP link for the January 18th event. That's going to be both virtual and in person. So you can choose what is the most comfortable way for you to participate and engage in our programming. Then lastly, January 19th, Central is hosting a resource fair where they're bringing both college partners, but also community-based partners for students who are just looking to have more information about different things that are specific to their identity and their needs. And this entire week is really reflective of our collaborative work as a district team and as our individual campuses to support EDIC for the colleges. Next slide, please. The one big thing I do want to highlight for everybody is one of our big efforts that we are pushing starting next month, and that is the Seattle College's Campus Climate Survey. So a bit of context around this, we are partnering with an organization called Insight to Diversity. So they are helping us in building this survey and disseminating it out to the campus community and to ensure that we have all of the information really accurately reflected in a report with us. The purpose of this climate survey is to understand the current culture as it relates to diversity and belonging to create actionable steps for improvement and change. And I really wanna emphasize that this is actionable steps. Our goal with strong response rates is that we can really take all of this information and help us really build out a strategic plan and work with other members on campus to say, this is the information we're getting that might directly impact you in the work that you're doing. How can we really pop, you know, process that and move forward and create a plan ahead to support equity, diversity, inclusion, and community across all of the colleges. As a reminder, this is coming from a state requirement. So 5227, colleges have to conduct this campus climate survey every five years. And so this is us kicking it off. It is an anonymous survey. That's the biggest thing we want to emphasize. There are going to be factors in there that we also want to be able to know. Are you staff? Are you faculty? Um, but ultimately, it will be absolutely anonymous. And we are going to just really use this information again to create that strategic work. There'll be four survey types. So everyone in our community will have an opportunity to share their information. That's students, administrators, faculty, and staff. There are general questions for all these groups. And then there are gonna be sections that are really specific to each role and sections that are specific to, to a person's identity. So there might be one about, are you a first gen person? Some of you will fill that out, some of you will not. That's the process of the survey. So there'll be lots of components to capture different pieces and different experiences. And your survey will really reflect those pieces that are specific to you. Next slide. And lastly, just want to note that this is going to be rolling out starting February 9th. We anticipate giving folks one month to complete this, and we really, really want to encourage as much participation. In an ideal world, that would look like 100% people completed this. Realistically, we're probably going to go with a different number, but we do hope it is a high response rate, and I would love to see North have a very, very high response rate so that we can turn that into some good, actionable steps for our team. And that is all I have on the EDIC side. All right.
Thanks, Marie. Um, I'll, I'll tag in. Good afternoon, y'all. Uh, Josh Ertz, he, him, his. I think most of y'all know me. I'm the HR director primarily uh, assigned to support North as well as the units reporting to the vice chancellor for academic and student success. Um, I'm going to take the next couple of minutes, try not to be as long-winded as normal, and kind of hit some highlights from the last year. I'm not going to try to uh, bore you with the dry HR stuff, like please make sure your addresses are up to date and that you've opted in to receive your W-2 through CT ceiling. But that is the nudge to, as we hit W-2 season, to make sure you've updated your address in CT ceiling. Um, there'll be emails going out about that sorts of things. So please be on the lookout for those emails from HR district. Uh, I'm gonna take the next five, 10 minutes, kind of hit some highlights from last year. As you all may recall, when we had this meeting last January, uh, we were just uh, transitioning James Grigsby in as our new HR business partner after Melissa, after Melissa Pond left for Wazoo. We were talking about options for, um, it was right when Sylvia Juarez indicated she was leaving the associate director role at the district and kind of looking at those options for the HR team. So we've done some of those things. So I want to highlight kind of what those transitions are, some things that um, we're doing that are new this week in HR that are gonna really impact the day-to-day -day work for most of you in a positive way. And I promise they're not process changes. And then also foreshadow some process changes uh, coming down the line. Um, and a lot of this is, is driving kind of the strategic plan and our core mission and values of the district because HR is essentially a district-wide group. Mike, if you could jump us over to the next slide. Um, a big part of that has been the addition of the HR Director of Talent Management and Diversity Recruiting, Tim Collins. Um, this is an outgrowth of Sylvia's uh, transition and the dissolution of that Associate Director role. So, uh, many of you have worked with Tim uh, in this capacity and having someone dedicated to our talent management and diversity recruiting across the district has uh, really been fruitful in a lot of ways. So Tim transitioned from the HR Director to South into this other role last March. Um, so a big part of that has been transitioning from our uh, passive uh, to an active recruitment style, right? So historically we post the jobs, we're not reaching out, um, you know, we're posting on higher ed jobs, you know, they're getting picked up by the scrapers, but we're not actually reaching out. Uh, one of Tim's strong suits is going out and helping actually source candidates. We've had some really good luck and some good, um, really strong pools that we've been able to tap into at North, uh, calling back to Pete's you know, discussion earlier. You know, we BC, we hired BC for the application development position. Um, we had to go back out for recruitment initially. That's a second recruitment for that. We've been able to source good recruitments partially because of the work Tim has done. And I do want to give a shout out to Rocky also because I know Rocky uh, has helped do some graphics for our Instagram and to advertise page, uh, our job openings on Instagram um, and some of those things. So um, when we have those high profile or those hard to fill positions, um, you know, that's something you can reach directly out to Tim and, and through us. Um, Part of that is also he's managing and reinvigorating our inclusion advocate program. We had a training not too long ago, and then you all saw the email that went out yesterday as well about the training coming up in February. Um, that will add about 50 new IAs by the end of February to our inclusion advocate pool, which is great news because uh, you know people have transitioned on, people have become busier, and, and we can't and shouldn't be tapping the same people over and over and over again to serve in this important role um, that can lead to fatigue, that can, you know, uh, just unfair distribution of labor. Um, they've also, he's also reinstituted uh, and started re-pulling together those quarterly IA meetings. So if you're somebody who's interested in being an inclusion advocate, we have a lot of searches coming up. Um, so we can do that. Uh, to Kelda's question in the chat, uh, can every department be able to access this level of support? Definitely for recruitments on like full-time faculty, Tim is uh, basically spearheading all the 35 uh, recruitments for full-time faculty across the district. Um, we do need to be mindful of some of our resources, um, but some things are getting, you know, most of our jobs are getting posted to LinkedIn now. Um, if you have a position where you think we may need some help, um, definitely reach out to uh, the HR recruiter assigned to that job. And um, that's kind of a little bit of foreshadowing to the next part of this in a second. Um, the other thing is, is we've got search committee training, uh, which has been a, a lot more efficient. We're no longer doing um, single 
you know, every committee interviewing or just doing a, a training for one committee. Uh, we're doing those district wide now. We're up to about 500 staff employees across the district who've gone through search and screen training in the last year. That is almost 25% of our employee headcount if you include students and part time hourly. If you kind of take out students part time hours, that's about a third of our employees who've gone through that process. So that is awesome. That is great. That's also a reminder of please don't tap the same people to serve on every committee um, because we, uh, while recruitment is one of the most important things we can do for employees. Uh, to get staff in here so we're staffed up appropriately uh, we, we do all have day jobs um, also so just something to be mindful of uh, next slide please kind of the uh, foreshadowing of this i will be the first to admit that we know hr is a bottleneck and a pain point um, put things in perspective we have 15 percent more staff than spokane but have 75 percent of the hr staff that they do um, to that end, we've added uh, uh, each of the three campuses an HR consultant role to handle those transactional pieces. Um, there'll be an email going out next week. Juliana started on Monday at North. Um, didn't want to put her name on the slide because I want to give her a little bit of chance to ease in and everybody reaching out, right? So um, that will help and really um, relieve kind of that bottleneck that admittedly is the, the HR director and the business partner on. Uh, hiring, onboarding, I-9s, um, you know, tracking down people to finish their paperwork, all that sort of stuff. That's going to be a primary part of her role. Um, some of you have already probably gotten emails from her about your new hires and clearing out some of those backlogs. Um, and she's on day two because she's only 50% FTE right now. Um, once we kind of get through that, and then she transitions to full-time, she will also be taking on a more active role in the recruitment piece, which will then free up James and I to do some of these higher level strategy pieces, um, doing more consultative work um, and not having that team. We are still um, a team of 27 across the district. Spokane is a team of 31, but we're getting better. And we really hope that will help with service delivery um, to our, the people we serve. Um, next slide. Um, as a reminder, um, about 60% of the questions we do get are questions that can be uh, answered through inside. Um, so if you have questions about processes for hiring a position and what those steps are, um, a lot of that is on inside as well as who your primary points of contacts are for things. Um, as a general reminder, about a year and a half ago, we transitioned to campus-based payroll partners as opposed to by employee classification. So if you have classified payroll questions, uh, please don't reach out to Linda Brazil anymore. Um, she's still getting random emails from folks who've been with North for a while. Uh, Young Lim is your primary point of contact for those questions. Uh, Linda is still with us. Uh, she is just primarily serving um, South. Um, that's where you can find copies of your collective bargaining agreements, your shop stewards, your union stewards. Again, those step-by-step -step processes for requesting new positions, going out for recruitment, all for letter templates. Um, when folks uh, you know, retire, resign, um, the offboarding instructions, how to change supervisors and CTC link, all, a lot of that is already in there with those screenshots and those step-by-step -step, um, pieces. Along the same lines with that, um, org charts are up on there. Right, and so if you're wondering like what's a position number, every position at North has a position control number, um, and that helps us track for budgeting purposes. And also, you know, as people transition and, and all that sort of fun stuff, um, that's all up there on those org charts. So if you're not quite sure who's in a role and you're like, I think somebody might have left, um, can't quite figure it out on the website, that should be in the org charts. They were last updated in November. We're updating them again this January. That's going to become a monthly. Uh, task that's going to be actually part of our HR consultants portfolio. Along the same lines, um, as a general reminder, the, oh, the salary schedules for classified staff on OFM's website don't reflect the 5% King County premium pay. Um, if you're looking for salary schedules with King County premium pay, you can go on inside. They are in there. Um, so just a reminder about that. Next slide. A couple newish tools that are coming down the pipeline in our future and near future. Um, I can't help but you know make a science joke in here with this. We are joining IT with Solar Winds. So if you all saw the email about a month ago from Cindy Ritchie that IT is transitioning their ticketing system to Solar Winds, um, HR is also going to join them in that uh, during this quarter. Uh, don't worry, we'll send out some emails and we'll talk about what that's going to look like. But for things like um, 
employee verifications, if you have questions about your benefits, um, instead of you know having to send an email and having a long thread and ping Alan, and then maybe it's actually a question for somebody else. It'll all be in that ticketing system. So it'll be a lot smoother for everybody. Um, it'll help increase accountability. Um, and it'll also help prevent things getting lost in email because uh, we all get a lot of email. Um, things can kind of get stuck in there. Um, We've been saying it for two years. Um, we are down to like one or two forms in liquid office e-forms, but um, there's a meeting tomorrow morning with the RIT team again. So um, shout out to, you know, Rick and his team and Lynn and John Davis for really helping get on base up and running. Um, so we will, you will be seeing that, um, but we do know there's still the stipend e-form and that sort of stuff. And then last but not least, um, we are working with the state board on expanding the self-service tools in CTC Link. Um, we really are um, trying to explore how we can take full advantage of that so we don't have to do things via email like combo code changes. And a lot of that's gonna take enhancement requests where we have to petition the state, but um, you have at least two headstrong HR directors across this district who don't mind pushing the state to use CTC Link and PeopleSoft to its full uh, advantage. So um, we're working with the state board now on proposals so we can do things like change combo codes in CTC Link as opposed to having to send an email with a spreadsheet to the business office and then they have to send it somewhere else and we hope it doesn't get lost or go, it goes to the wrong person. Um, so hopefully make everyone's life more efficient. And then with that, I will transition it over to Jill for accreditation. Hi, everybody. My name is Jill Lane. I am full-time um, instructor for political science, but am doing full-time work release on our accreditation visit for 2023. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, the Northwest College of uh, Commission on Colleges and Universities is our accrediting body. There is a big visit every seven years, and that happens for us May 1st, 2nd, and 3rd of this year. We have established an accreditation workroom in 2261D. So it's across the hall from Pete where the really bright yellow walls <laughs> will um, overwhelm you, but at least you can find where I am. Um, we're in the process now of editing our draft accreditation report. The commission is, seven years ago gave us several recommendations, which we have cleared, except for a couple dealing with assessment and program review. Um, I'm going to keep my portion of this very short. So there's a few minutes for questions and you can expect weekly updates from me starting next week where I will do facts of the week and maybe we can have a contest or something to make it fun too. Um, we are also updating the North Seattle College web links. If you are unhappy or want to update your pages for your programs um, and want to share some of the good works that you are doing, please contact me. Rocky has been tasked to help, and we've been doing a lot of updates on that. Um, it's been, I mean, Rocky's gotten a lot of shout outs. She deserves every one of them. I appreciate her beyond words. Um, we are also in the process of gathering exhibits. The way, um, if you were here seven years ago and you went through an accreditation process, the report was much more detailed and it wasn't um, digitalized in any way yet. So the report was about this thick. And this time, however, the report has a word limit around 100 pages and we are to provide exhibits, which can be web pages or PTFs, PDFs and um, S drive. Uh, we are highlighting a lot of the good works on campus. We have uh, the climate change grant, the LSAMP uh, counseling. If there's something you would like to highlight too, please have this to me by April 10th. Uh, um, if you would like it to be in the report itself, I need to have it by February 10th. Um, next slide, please. You, this is super tiny for a lot of you. So let me just share that the draft of the accreditation seven-year report is due to production by February 13th. If you would like to include an exhibit in this that I have not already contacted you about, um, please have it to me by February 10th. Um, yes, and also a shout out to our ASL interpreter who must be very tired now. I appreciate you, thank you. Um, we will begin on the next faculty development day holding regular um, preparatory 
meetings and parties to help everyone get ready for um, the accreditation visit. We are very fortunate to have had contact and are working with Walla Walla who had their visit last quarter. So um, we, you can plan on a mock visit and I'll be popping up all over the place. You'll be very sick of me by the end of this. Again, the dates for the visit are May 1st, 2nd and 3rd. I will have a nervous breakdown on May 4th. So that is how we're going to do it. And I am here for anyone who has questions um, now or whenever and um, for the examples. Next slide, please. And let me pass this off to, I'm not sure who's doing this one. That's me. Um, thank you. Yeah, I go back. That's, Dr. that's me. Yeah, thank you, Jane. Uh, Jill, I'm sorry. Thank I was you. thinking Jill Lane. Thank you, that's Jill, okay. <laughs> um, for doing this work. Accreditation is a heavy lift. And you're so well versed in it and uh, you understand our needs and you worked on our last project. And I really, really appreciate you wanting to step up again. And I hope you don't have a nervous breakdown the day after they leave. <laughs> um, we do need to have a party though, or something. <laughs> uh, because the sooner they're here, the sooner they leave. And, and I'm sure we'll be fine. Y'all have done great work. We're just documenting it and we'll give them what they need and send them on their way. So you, you, uh, for the college community, your uh, cooperation is appreciated. Your immediate responses are appreciated when something is requested. Um, it's just a part of how we do what we do. And it reassures our students that we're accredited. And this is a good place to come for their education. Uh, this last slide here was well, not the last slide, but it's a slide that I wanted to share with you all. Um, last fall, the executive team and uh, the leadership team in particular, a broader leadership team, but uh, particularly executive team, had a retreat where we needed to you know, talk about a few things, talk about our progress, talk about our challenges, um, talk about future responsibilities. And we also wanted to establish some, some leadership guiding principles. Um, and this is not just for other people. This is for us. Everyone leads from where they are. You don't have to have an administrative title. Um, we know that everyone leads from where they are at some point. Uh, and so these are the things that we wanted to remind ourselves of on a daily basis, regardless of, of any challenges. Um, we're committed to these principles and we're hoping that um, those of you who consider yourselves leaders, we know that there are some folks who don't consider themselves leaders who really are, uh, but we hope you embrace these as well. And you will see these uh, popping up, this document popping up all over campus. Uh, so just to touch base very quickly, um, we've committed to developing a growth mindset, which includes, you know, finding, focusing on solutions uh, and leaning into our strengths and to cultivate leadership. I have no doubt, and I actually said this yesterday, I have no doubt that there are individuals in this room, classified, faculty, staff, who will be in these very seats, whether it be president, vice president, dean, you know, you all are the future of North. And so we wanna make sure to try to cultivate leadership, um, healthy leadership. Uh, and we're trying to look for opportunities in all of the many challenges that we faced uh, over the last two and a half, almost three years. We're making every effort to think strategically, trying to make data informed decisions, not data driven, but data informed decisions while keeping students first and student success in mind. Uh, and we're gonna make every effort to be accountable for uh, our decisions and to try to communicate clear expectations, to be clear is to be kind, and to commit ourselves to the college mission and the college community. And we want people to be inspired here at North. Yes, we have challenges, every college has challenges, but how we manage them uh, is what's important. And we wanna inspire each other. We wanna lead by example. Uh, and we want people to feel empowered. If you're in an in a official leadership role, empower your teams uh, with knowledge, information, and the tools that they need to be successful. Uh, and support and coach each other. Uh, be a good listener. Uh, that's what we intend to do, uh, even more so. And you know, do so with civility and collegiality. And regardless of your philosophy on whether we are colleagues or not, we really are. We all have a role to play in student success and in the support of students. 
and so it's important that we support each other in a collegial fashion. And then caring for yourself and others. Um, you know, we we talk a lot about uh, care and concern around here for each other, and that is so important. The work that Dr. Mao and her team are doing to support students along the lines of care and concern and, and mental health and support, that's so important for us as faculty and staff and as well. Uh, and so, you know, you've, you've seen me send out emails saying, you know, to, to have a little grace and to be a little patient and all of that. We all need that, pandemic or no. Um, we are emerging from COVID. We, we, it's not going to go away, but we're, we're back. And so we need to try and nurture each other and support each other, um, establish healthy boundaries, uh, and then invest in lifelong learning, which I know many of us do. Uh, and if there's any way that we can support you as an administration to do so, um, and as the leaders and unofficial leaders on campus to do so, please speak out and let us know. Um, all of these things are going to be important uh, for the future of North and us moving forward. Uh, and it, it benefits us all when, when it is supported. Uh, so with that, uh, that was kind of my summary, but um, we are going to try to answer questions in the chat. We have about five minutes. Uh, answer questions in the chat. And also, if we didn't get to your question, you see here on the screen the link to a feedback form. Uh, and if you want to pull up your phone and scan the QR code, you can also go to the feedback form. And what we will do is answer your questions and then put them in the next news briefs. Or if there are enough questions, we'll just do a separate message uh, to answer all of the questions. So with that, we have five minutes. Does anyone want to ask a question live? And again, I'm scanning the chat and hopefully the rest of the team is scanning the chat as well to answer questions. Jim has a, a question, second to last in the chat right now. Let's see, a 360 review process. There have been small steps in the past, proposal for program similar to tips teaching. You know what, actually, Jim, that's a great recommendation. But as you know, with the 360 process, there is a buildup that is required. Uh, for 360 reviews. You don't just step right into a 360 review uh, cold. So we have discussed things like 360 reviews. There are other tools out there that are beneficial. Uh, but what that does, just for those of you who don't know, it not only gives leadership a chance to look at, uh, we look at each other, but we also look at our environment. Um, 360 reviews can be weaponized as well. And that's something that we're not interested in. But yes, to answer your question, we are looking at different evaluative tools. We're looking at compression planning uh, and, and those kinds of things that promote that type of evaluation. Uh, and we're also looking at leadership opportunities. You know, there's something about the Seattle colleges that I've learned in the last couple of years is that we're not necessarily out there as much as we should be. We have amazing programs, amazing faculty and staff, and we're very much in uh, the shell of, you know, Seattle and technically, you know, state of Washington. And we have so much to offer that can be shared outside of Washington and outside of Seattle. And there's so many resources around us. And so those are the kinds of things that we want people to do is participate in, you know, conferences and do presentations and all of that so that, you know, leadership can be developed and, you know, those leaders coming behind us can have the confidence and the tools necessary to step into that next role. So thank you for that question. Uh, was there another one? Okay, I think that is Michael Saunders still online? Someone had a question about, specifically about the restroom. Mike, are you still there? Michael, you still there? There was yeah, a I'm here. I'm okay. Here. There was a question early on, specifically about why the restrooms were locked off and when they would be reopened. And I'm looking for it in the chat. Let's see. Uh, Heidi, Heidi Iverson asked the question. During the building updates, was there an update regarding the men's restroom at the north end of AS? My students desperately need this reopened. And also why the female rest, why is the female restroom periodically closed seemingly for no reason? 
I am not sure why the female restroom has been periodically closed. I'm not clear on that one. The men's restroom is having a uh, drainage issue that we're trying to clear, but we've had other priorities pop up with the uh, building shutdowns and haven't been able to address it. But I will pop that up on my priority now that I'm uh, done with the education building and we will get that cleared and get that opened right away. Thanks so much, Michael. Uh -huh. Appreciate it. Okay, we have like one minute. Uh, keep in mind that um, the recording will be sent out. The PowerPoint will be sent out. Uh, and again, we will respond to any questions uh, that were asked offline or via the feedback form. So if there is nothing else, y'all, thank you all so much. We have about 30 minutes left for our winter fest. So if you are on campus, please go down and, and check out what's going on. Um, we There's some, it's this awesome being out there with the students and visiting the table. So please take the time to do so. And yes, Kelda, I was gonna ask you to talk about the two murals. Do you wanna come on, come li uh, go live and tell us about that? <laughs> I can, yeah. <laughs> Great, thank you. <laughs> Hi everyone. Um, yeah, we're excited to, offer a spring um, mural class again. The class is Art 240 Mural Art. And um, with Tanya Hino's leadership and her uh, partnership with the Art Council, chaired by Amanda Knowles and myself, um, we are excited to identify a wall on the uh, east side of the OCE&E building. And uh, the next year we're planning on a James Baldwin uh, focused mural around the library. So two years and two murals generously funded um, by Dr. Crawford and we're thrilled. Well, and, and that actually, uh, thank you Kilda for bringing it forward and uh, kudos to the North Seattle Community College Foundation because that's where the funds are coming from. Uh, and the, you know, the funds have been set aside and commissioned. So I am so excited to see what y'all do. The work so far has been amazing on many of our murals. So we're going to keep our eyes open. Thank you all so much for that. All right. If there is nothing else, again, have a wonderful afternoon. If you're on campus, please try to visit the Winterfest tables. There's a lot going on out there and our students put a lot of work into it. Thank you all so much. We appreciate you for what you do for our students. And we appreciate your support and we will keep you posted with regards to the legislative session and budget and everything else. Take care, everyone.